So you told me that you sprained your, your left ankle mm -hmm. and I've compared motion on both sides and I'm going to demonstrate cuboid motion. So I walk along the fifth metatarsal here where it falls off that little shelf there. Mm -hmm. One finger above that is cuboid. So I pinch it with my thumb and index finger below and I'm just oscillating it up and down and there's good motion there. Okay. And then to find the navicular, it's this bump right here, this prominent bump. And another way of finding the navicular and the midfoot, which is the cuneiform bones, is you take a finger down the shin, and then when it comes down to the foot, you leave a finger's width, okay? And you come in front of that with two fingers, so my middle and index finger captures the midfoot. And then I twist it medially to flatten your arch, and I can oscillate it. You have good normal motion there, okay? And then to test motion of the subtalar joint, which is the joint below the ankle, uh, that's where the, the calcaneus, the heel, connects to the talus. Very complex joint. Uh, it abducts, so the foot goes outward when I push the back of the heel to the left, okay? And then also it everts, so the bottom of the heel goes out to the right, so I'm pushing out. You don't have a lot of movement there, but at least I can spring it. So that's your norm. Okay? And so we'll compare that to the left ankle. So uh, one could call this cuboid syndrome, and I have lots of YouTube videos on, on cuboid syndrome. Um, your ankle dorsiflexion is good. We did test upward motion of the fibula. We tested backward motion of the malleolus, and we tested forward motion of the lateral malleolus, and I went up to the fibular head, and it had good normal anterior glide mobility. Okay? Um, when I come to the cuboid, there's no up and down motion. No motion at all. I did test your anter anterior talofibular ligament. You are tender down here, I understand that. But with a drawer test, there's, no, there's not excessive movement. So that ligament is intact. And when I invert your foot and overpressure it, that's strong. So there's no lengthening of the calcaneofibular ligament lateral. Okay, so now midfoot, again we bring the finger down here and then we capture it right above there and there's, I'm not able to get any rotational mobility there. Alright, so now I'll grab the heel on the lower part and I'm going to push it outward to the left and there is the slightest give. It's so much less than the right side and I'm trying to spring it and there's no give, there's no motion there. Okay, and then I'm twisting the heel to the right and the foot goes outward just so little, such a small amount, and then there's no more movement. So your subtalar joint is restricted, okay? So what I'm going to do is unlock the subtalar joint first. So let's have you lie on your stomach and then I want your feet to overhang. Perfect. Nice. So when I restore movement in the subtalar joint, I start by grabbing the calcaneus and tractioning it downward. So I'm pulling your heel towards me. And I keep that force for 30 seconds. I want to take up all the slack. I want to gap that joint. And then I stabilize the lower leg. And now I can get twisting motion. So the magic might simply be in distracting that joint. But I'm going to go ahead and oscillate it 30 times.
And this lack of motion here will reduce motion in the first and second vertebrae in your neck. It's okay. C1, C2, also called the atlanoaxial joint. When we lose motion here, we'll lose uh, motion up there. And that's a reflex. That's how the body compensates. And so when we restore motion here, then that motion in the upper cervical spine is restored. Wow. So I can now evert you very similar to the other foot. And now I can twist the subtalar joint. That's called abduction because the foot goes outward. So that's now restored. Let's have you lie on your back, please. All right, so I'm going to test the midfoot, and guess what? Your midfoot now pronates. Mm -hmm. You have good motion there. So I didn't even have to treat the midfoot. And the midfoot has a, okay, so the, the rear foot, the calcaneus, connects to the talus. I'm sorry, to the cuboid. There's a calcaneocuboid joint, very big joint. So if you free up the calcaneus, then oftentimes the cuboid is free. Um, there's very little in the literature on that concept. Uh, it's mentioned in one article uh, in JOSPT, uh, published many years ago, I don't remember, but you could search JOSPT and search cuboid, and uh, that, that author does mention that cuboid can go up and down. Uh, most uh, cuboid articles just tell us about the cuboid whip where they, where they thrust it up and out. And maybe that gaps the joint, but in your example, your foot was in a supinatory pattern, so the cuboid was up and out. So whipping it out would not have been the right maneuver. It needs to come down and in, but it came down and in because we freed up the subtalar joint, which in turn freed up the midfoot, including the navicular and the cuneiforms, and the cuboid freed up automatically. So this is how you mobilize a cu cuboid without directly mobilizing the cuboid. Okay? okay? And I suspect there's a lot of people out there that get the cuboid whip, but it just doesn't last. In the literature, you hear about the good successes, the sweet successes, which do happen. Um, but I think there's another population where they're not addressing the, the rest of the problem, including rear foot and midfoot. Um, so that is a lot better. And there's an exercise that I want to have you do. So you can sit up and watch me and I'll film this exercise. All right, so actually every time you walk, your foot's now gonna, gonna go into pronation and then into resupination. So it's gonna find, it'll find the pronation. So just walking reinforces this. Nonetheless, I'm gonna give you a, a little homework, mm -hmm. all right? So your left foot points straight forward and your right foot points outward, okay? Um, when I say forward, I mean your natural stance. You naturally stand with your, with your hips externally rotate, that's by design. That has to do with the shape of the joint. So just stand normally and then point your right foot out more. Pretend there's an axis going through your left ankle, knee, hip, and shoulder. And all you're doing is twisting your body all the way to the right. And then you do little, little rotations at end range, okay? And what you want to feel, and maybe it'll take 10 reps or so, but you wanna feel the midfoot flatten on the left and you wanna feel the heel evert. Okay? And you want to do 30 of those. Let's have you do 30 a day for three weeks. Okay. And that'll retain your nervous system and retain, retrain the joints. And, and um, you probably had some muscle inhibition. I didn't test your strength, but probably the everters of the ankle were inhibited somewhat. And this re releases that inhibition. Okay. Okay? So um, let's have you walk and just see how you feel.
I feel like my, my, my feet are more forward now. It feels like your feet are more forward? Yeah. Nice. But I mean, I'm not even, I'm like constantly not trying to like overcorrect. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You're just walking naturally. Yeah. Okay. So elaborate. They feel like they're a little more forward? Yeah. So they're not, I guess if before they were 30 degrees, now they're probably, you know, 15 degrees maybe. Okay. Alrighty. Um, can you tell that the left foot now flattens? Like in or out? Down. Or in. Yeah, in. Yeah, I mean, it feels good, so. Good. Nice. Alrighty.